Welcome everybody. We are just going to wait a couple of minutes for uh, everyone to join us and then we will get started. Just wait for the number at the bottom to creep up a little further. Lovely. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our fellows and guest talk this evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Holly Besley, and I am one of the senior learning officers here at ZSL. Um, very excited to be chairing our event this evening on Pathways to Conservation, um, which promises to be quite a uh, fun discussion of the ins and outs of different uh, conservation and biology related careers through the stories of uh, the guys that you can now see on screen with me. Um, there are so many different directions a passion for wildlife can take you in. I know myself personally that I I had absolutely no idea that conservation charities had education teams uh, 10 years ago when I was embarking on my zoology degree. Um, so we hope that this evening can act as a bit of an enjoyable insight into the different routes out there, uh, maybe help inspire those of you that might be early uh, in those stages of your career. Um, before I properly introduce to you everyone that you can see um, on screen, I just need to run through a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we'll be keeping everyone muted throughout the talk, but you can engage with us through the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, so if you're having any technical issues, uh, you can't hear us at all at any point, do please send us a message through there. Um, and Lindsay, who's working way behind the scenes that you can see in the top corner, um, will be able to help you. Um, also, there'll be uh, time towards the end, um, as always, for your questions. So please do submit any that occur to you uh, during the talk using the Q&A button, which is separate from the chat one, um, at the bottom of the screen. And we will put these to our panel um, as and when they come up, which would be great. Um, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome um, and introduce our panel for this evening. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Daniela Rabaiotti, who is a postdoctoral research scientist at ZSL's Institute of Zoology uh, and popular science writer as well. We have Daniel Kane, who is a senior keeper um, in ZSL London Zoo's herpetology department. And we have Kate Moses, a conservation scientist and project manager within ZSL's conservation and technology team. Um, so to kick us off this evening, uh, each of them is going to take us on a bit of a whistle stop tour of their career up to this point um, and what they currently spend their work days doing and I think if it's okay Kate we're going to start with you. Yep of course uh, so as Holly said I'm Kate Moses I'm a project manager so I work within the monitoring and technology program here at ZSL uh, I've been here for about three and a half years uh, I would say that like most of the folks that I work with uh, my pathway to get here sort of wasn't linear, definitely. Uh, between us, we've got a really broad skill set. So within my team, there are people who have backgrounds in finance, the military, education and web design, amongst many others. So, yeah, it's definitely not a linear path to get into conservation. People come from all sort of walks of life. Um, for me, I started out by doing an undergrad in animal behaviour which was a, a great introduction to the world of scientific research. And it taught me a lot. But I think personally, with hindsight, that I realised that although this was a really interesting degree and I did love it, it was quite niche in terms of the opportunities that it opened up for me um, because they would be very academically focused and that wasn't necessarily a path that I wanted to pursue. Um, so for me, a bit later on, there was sort of a realisation that I would need to broaden my skill set. Uh, but during my undergrad, as well as the academic based work, I was lucky enough to be able to join a couple of really cool volunteer projects in South Africa as part of my degree. So uh, joining a game reserve and working on with a, like a marine conservation project, which, yeah, they both provided me really fantastic opportunities to start to gain some hands on experience. Um, and just a little side note on that, like although they, they were incredible opportunities and I loved every second of them and I wouldn't switch them for the world, um, I would say based on my personal experience um, that I gained more insights and learned a lot more from other sort of more less costly volunteering experience. So I wouldn't wor worry if those 
sort of opportunities aren't open to you. I've been able to gain a lot more experience through other volunteering opportunities that I've, I've come across like throughout the, my pathway to getting to ZSL. Um, but yes, yeah, so I undertook my degree in animal behaviour and then I graduated in 2008 as the recession began to hit. So unfortunately, the sort of dwindling numbers of entry level jobs within conservation, which was the field I decided I wanted to go into. So I spent a couple of winters working abroad in the snow and then I spent a fantastic summer volunteering with an organisation called Archelon, who are the Sea Turtle Protection Society of Greece. Um, for me, that was a really excellent opportunity to really gain experience across a number of areas of conservation. So um, unlike the previous volunteering that I mentioned, where I think we were very much like the reserves and the projects functioned as a whole without us, we were just there to learn and to watch and observe. Whereas this charity, we were really like they were dependent on us being there to do stuff day to day. Um, and yeah, so we worked across monitoring, public engagement, fundraising, uh, data, and it sort of really then began to give me a good understanding um, of issues that relate to human wildlife coexistence. So a good experience of that firsthand. Um, following on from that, I was able to secure myself a six month position as a practical conservation worker with the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Um, we were a team of about 10 who worked across a number of reserves. We covered quite a large area of Scotland. So we get called in to implement solutions and learn about different strategies to protect endangered native species, including ospreys. We did things like set up a raft that um, had a camera that transmitted back to the visitor centre. So we were doing practical, very practical things out and about in reserves that was really enjoyable, but sadly it was just sort of lasted. It was a six month contract. Um, and after that point, I was working in a number of sort of temp based roles that were quite unrelated to the field I wanted to work into, uh, to move into. And I was applying for conservation roles and not progressing as I'd have liked to. So I put sort of time and effort into understanding what was required to be eligible for those roles and my conclusion was a master's like that's what I saw coming up time and time again in job specs so I spent time researching options and determined sort of what it was I wanted to get from it so ultimately I decided on a master's in biodiversity and conservation at the University of Leeds because for me like I said it, it hit a number of criteria I looked I was looking for and I knew that they are particularly um informed by industry as to the skills and things that they know that graduates will need in order to be successful. Um, so yeah, I went to Leeds. I studied part time there whilst working full time. I met Danny, who's also on call this evening. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, so I was working full time in an unrelated sector. Um, like it was really great masters for me. You could really, it was a very broad ranging in terms of the modules offered, I very much tailored it to my intended career path and interest whilst also picking up, like they offered some really great um, skills that are maybe being, that you see declining at, within conservation and that are valued. So things like IDing skills. So we did modules in insect IDing, which was really interesting. And I wouldn't have been able to get that experience elsewhere. Um, and then for my thesis, we were provided with a number of potential projects. Um, but I'm particularly interested in human wildlife coexistence, which actually wasn't something that was offered. Um, and I was also keen to begin to start to make external connections. And so knowing that I ultimately wanted to end up working for ZSL, I did some research online and I was looking for colleague uh, for ZSL scientists who work in human wildlife coexistence and reached out to one of them. And they didn't have an opportunity for a student to join them but they passed my details on to a colleague who I was lucky enough to join for my project for my research um, during which I gained a like a wealth of experience I found that was you know it was a very intense month like months work of field work but I learned an awful lot during that it was really valuable to me um, and I think finishing like from my master's I recognized that I was unable to likely transition straight into a conservation career after finishing it given how competitive 
the field of conservation is. So I decided to progress within the career path that I was in, which I said is completely unrelated. I was working for a logistics company, um, but I wanted to develop, like to allow myself to develop transferable skills. So I was working both within IT and software development and then within a commercial team. So working with data. Um, so sort of making sure that I could maximize everything I could from my career in terms of transferable skills. But at the same time as that, I also took on local voluntary work with a couple of organizations. I signed up as a mentor at Leeds Uni. Um, and also <laughs> it was quite geeky, but I started, I created a document. So I was, as I was coming across job specs of jobs that I wanted to be able to get, I was again, looking for those skills and noting down what it was that people were looking for and like then working out how I could make sure I could go out and get them or get them for my role of volunteering, make that happen. Um, I then saw a job spec for a three month entry level position at ZSL that was looking for a more unusual blend of skills that I just happened to have. It was quite fortunate. Um, so I did, I was, I sent off my application. I did a, a huge amount of interview prep and ultimately was successful but I would say something that I think is really important to flag here is that I think it only becomes apparent when you're either um, the person doing the hiring sat on the other side of the table as I've been since then or once you've got the job but it's just how competitive the field of conservation is so we know it's competitive but then once I got my role I was told that for that three-month temporary position there were 150 applicants, some of whom had PhDs. So that gives you an idea of sort of the level of competition that you are up against. So I'd say, like, really, please bear that in mind when you are spending a lot of time applying for positions and you don't hear back. Like, please just keep going and don't take it personally. It's not, you know, it's not personal. It is just a ridiculously competitive environment. It took me 18 months of job hunting and applications to be able to get this role. Um, so yeah, don't, don't take it personally, would be my advice, definitely. Um, and then yeah, I started at ZSL as a project assistant. I was brought in to help organise the Zoo Hackathon event that we held to bring coders together to tackle wildlife-based challenges. Um, and I was fortunate because of my position was temporary, but then was extended, which then allowed me to sort of work across a broader range of projects within the team and build up my experience, which ultimately allowed me to then progress to become a project coordinator and then a, a project manager. Um, and I'd say day to day, I work across a number of technology focused projects. Uh, I mainly spend my time on Instant Wild, which is instantwild.zsl.org. If you'd like to take a look, it's an online citizen science platform and app which is free to download, um, that crowdsources camera trap image processing. So it means that you guys can get an insight into the world of wildlife whilst also benefiting the, the scientists who are using those camera trap imagery images to help understand the scientific question. Um, and I spend my time running the platform, but also thinking about how we can develop it, who we can partner with strategically, uh, writing funding applications to support the work and working with developers. We've got a couple of different teams of developers who help to maintain the platform and the app. So uh, I sort of act as a key link in between the two. Um, I've also spent time working on the development of Instant Detect, which is a satellite enabled threat detection system and time learning about within our, within my programs and my team, we have, have a couple of folks working on the development of low cost GPS tra tracking tags. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to go and help deploy them in the field when they were testing them. Um, so yeah, I think I'm really lucky to work here at ZSL. I have a, a very varied job that I really do love. Uh, and I work with a really fantastic team of dedicated, knowledgeable, enthusiastic people. Um, so yeah, that has re resulted in some really amazing experiences. So. Like I realise that getting into conservation is tough, but I would, really would encourage you to keep going because once you, you know, once you get there, it's just really worth it. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, moving from the conservation technology team to the zoo itself, we'll move over to Dan, who's going to give us um, his background to where he is today. Thanks, Holly. So hi, everyone, and thanks for taking the time to come and check us all out here. So my little pathway to 
I guess how I ended up here. Um, started when I was really young, as I imagine it probably did for a lot of people in the audience and also people who work in the zoo. So right in the middle there, that's me as about a five year old, I think. Might have been my birthday that day, I'm not too sure, but that's one of those memories that I don't know if, if, if other people think this way, but you have certain things that you don't know when or where exactly, but it's such a clear, vivid memory in your mind. And for me, that day, just holding that snake in my hands, I was just beside myself with excitement. Um, I think my parents weren't super keen on that kind of stuff, but you know, if ever we went to somewhere like, you know, anywhere, anywhere with animals, basically, if ever there was, let's say, a zookeeper saying, "Oh, is there anybody in the audience?" I'd be there, like, me, 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 me. My parents are like, oh, "Here we go again." So it's always me doing this sort of stuff, but I really, really liked it. Um, interestingly, never really set out to get into working with animals. I didn't really. Didn't really plan for it to happen in that sense but what I did do was always just have this you know major interest in the natural world so for me I grew up in the Lake District up in um, Cumbria in the north of England and obviously it's a very you know scenic part of the country and there's plenty of wildlife out there if you know where to look for it and that's what I spent a lot of my I guess childhood and you know years up there doing just spending time outside looking for birds, looking for reptiles, looking for whatever I could find, you know, near to my home as far as I could go on my bike, I would go and check things out. And that was really, really good fun for me. And I think looking back, that probably just kind of taught me a lot and put my mind into a certain way of thinking about things, which has really, you know, paid dividends these days. So um, when I was about 15 years old, I think I got an email from my local reptile and amphibian group who I'd been like a member of since I started. And there was somebody who found an adder, which is one of Britain's native snakes, only a couple of miles from my home. And it just blew my mind to think that these animals could live like so close to my house. Like, how lucky am I? So I went to go and check out this, um, this particular place and didn't see anything, but it didn't really put me off. So I went back again and again and again. And it took me something like seven trips to this one place. And I spent hours and hours and hours each time I went there, didn't see a thing. And then one time I saw a lizard and I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. Like, how cool is that? And then I think the next time I found my first ever wild adder by myself, and that was just like the start of it all for me. I thought, great, this is amazing. I can spend all my spare time here. It's like literally 10 minutes bike ride from my house. So as a teenager, that was me just sitting in some sort of, you know, scrubby edge of the woods sort of habitat watching these snakes, but I was having a great time. I loved it. Um, and when I was at school, we had to do a work placement. Um, it's just like a one week sort of thing to put us out into the sort of world of employment as a bit of a taster. So my mum really encouraged me to write a letter to my local zoo and see if they would have me. And I just thought, a bit like Kate was saying, I kind of had the idea that conservation and working with animals is really competitive. And I thought, no chance, there's not even any point me applying because they'll never take me. But after a couple of days of her saying, well, you know, you never know if you don't try, eventually I'll just write the letter and send it off. Well, probably she sent it off for me. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, lo and behold, got a nice reply. And the guy who ran the zoo, Rick, probably got this letter on his deck and, and thought, oh, great, there we go, free labour for a week, we'll take him. So I turned up there, um, had a great time, made a few friends at the zoo, which was great. And then over the years, from probably being about 15 years old, I always, you know, kind of kept on good terms with the people that worked there. And I would go back and volunteer in school holidays, or weekends, or over Christmas or just whenever my parents would drive me there, to be honest. Um, so I think for the zoo, I was just a nice, reliable source of free labour. So it worked for them and it worked for me because I had a great time. Learned a lot when I was there. And then I went off to university, um, did animal behaviour, Miss Kate, um, and graduated in 2013. Um, got a first class honours degree from that. And part of that, was the dissertation that I did, which was on that same group of adders that, that lived just a few miles down the road to my house. So all these years of me going there and just taking pictures and watching them, I, I learned so much. It was, it was so interesting and you could, you know, you can read all the books in the world, but I think nothing is sounds a bit cheesy, but I think really kind of gives it the same level of understanding as actually going out there and seeing these things for yourself. So I found out quite quickly that it's actually not that difficult to tell apart different individual adders as long as you can get a decent look at their heads. 
the particular arrangement of scales on top of the head and sometimes the markings there on the faces, they are all completely unique. Um, probably to snakes, they look as different as you know humans look to each other. But unless you know exactly what you're looking for, I guess it is maybe not the most simple thing to try and get your head around. But once I found that out, I thought, well, that's cool. Like I wonder, you know, the particular individuals always live in the same area. Do they ever you know, congregate together? Do they have friends and that sort of thing? You know, do they have particular personalities? And just through I think it was about seven or eight years in the end of me just sitting and watching these snakes on and off, you know, whenever I had the time or whenever I wanted to go there. Took all these pictures, built up a bit like Kate did, built up like a little database, a little spreadsheet of all my, you know, my local headers. And then at uni, part of that work was, uh, part of the work I did was a kind of population estimate, population size estimate. Um, so quite a simple thing just to mark, essentially a mark release recapture project, but without having to catch anything, you can just take a picture not disturb the animal, go back, let's say the next year, see if you see any of the ones that you saw the year before, and you do have some really simple stats on that, and you can work out essentially how large that population is estimated to be. So it's kind of cool for me, because I think in the end I saw about, it's about 24, 25 different individuals, but using this population estimate analysis, there was meant to be about 36 animals there. And it was, you know, I've got quite a, kind of mind that I guess I ask a lot of questions and I think a lot and I was always wondering where are these extra 10 or 11 snakes why can't I find them um but yeah that's that's just me anyway but yeah um did the dissertation got the degree um and then when I finished university I had applied for some jobs just generic sort of conservation environment outdoorsy type jobs um didn't really hear back from any of those there was one for a an ecological consultancy firm which I applied for. They offered me the job, but and this job was catching um, snakes from some like a building site down in Kent, I think it was. Um, and they wanted me to start on the day that I had my final university exam, and I, I obviously couldn't do that because I had to do that last exam to get the degree. And they would not budge in it at all. And I was just, I was so upset when I turned that job down. So I thought, God, this thing is so competitive to get into. I've literally been offered what I thought was my dream job and I, I, I just can't take it. And I was saying to them, like, look, I'll, I'll come down tomorrow. I'll do it the next day. Like, it's not a problem, but it just didn't work out that way. So I thought I'd blown it at that point. And I just thought, well, what to do now? So I moved back home, didn't really have an awful lot to do. So I thought after about, probably less than a week of sitting around not having a job, I got really bored. So I just thought, I oh, know, I'll call up Rick, I'll see if he's got space for me at the zoo, and I'll just go and volunteer for a, you know, a little bit and I'll see what happens. And I guess it was just one of those things There happened to be a few people, two keepers leaving that zoo in the next couple of weeks. So I guess just probably a mixture of me having put in like seven or eight years or so of volunteering without ever kind of aiming or hoping to work there. It just sort of happened. Eventually I then pop up at the right time, drop off a CV. I went off on holiday for two weeks, came back and I had a job. So lucky me. Um, so yeah, right place, right time, but also I guess I laid a lot of the, the groundwork, which really paid off for me. Um, so I stayed there for about a year and a half or so. And that zoo didn't have the biggest reptile collection, but I was really early on in my career, obviously like first proper job. so. The other guys that I worked with kept on telling me, like, don't know that you like reptiles. You think you do, but you never know. You might prefer cats or hoofstock or primates or anything like that. So I did a little bit of everything there. Always kind of went back to the reptiles, though. And then after I kind of did what I felt I could do there. So that's the lower picture in that group of those little baby tortoises. Um, that was my kind of, I guess, like my first little success at breeding things. And that's it. I'd never really bred any reptiles before. So I turned up, did that, did a few other things, which is quite good. Kind of got itchy feet, knew that I wanted more, knew that I could probably achieve more in maybe a larger place that had more resources. So got myself a job at the other end of the country down in Hampshire. And I worked in a college that had quite a nice collection of reptiles and amphibians. That was like a technician job. So I was basically, I was doing the, like the husbandry of the animals, but a lot of the job was talking to students and having groups of students and basically teaching them how to do what I do for a living. So it's almost like I then had my own little team of 20 or 30 zookeepers every day that all had, you know, very 
impressionable minds which is great because you could then really kind of feel like you're setting them on the right track and getting them into really good habits in terms of how to work with animals and achieve you know, good results but again kind of got itchy feet i knew that i knew that my heart wasn't really in it like i wasn't in it for the education side of things for me i wanted to do what i felt was like more more important to the individual animals as opposed to the individual people working with the animals so again started looking for new jobs and saw an advert for the job that i've got now at london zoo and for ages i wasn't going to apply for it because it was just up there on probably the Biazza website and only after about two weeks or so of just constantly going back and looking at the same job application i just thought you know yeah my mum did say like all those years ago if you never ask you'll never know so I just thought, why not I'll drop off a CV, send that and see what happens. And then a couple of weeks later, um, yeah, I had a really, really big surprise. And I got an email inviting me for an interview. And I was really, really over the moon with that. That was great. So um, luckily the interview fell on my day off at work because I don't think I would have been able to get the day off. I would have had to have pulled a sickie or something. And that's not really in my style. So um, yeah, I got the train down here, went to the interview. Had a nice chat, kind of loosely knew the two guys that were interviewing me just from, I suppose, just networking, just conferences and that sort of thing. And it's quite a small community. A lot of the time you like to see, see a lot of the same people and you end up recognising names of people that work in different zoos or different departments or anything like that. So it's kind of good to know people in that sense. And yeah, the interview went well, um, obviously, here I am now. Um, so I've been in this job for about five years now. I think it was five years last month, actually. And in that time, I've gone from being a qualified to a senior zookeeper. Um, and the, I guess the difference between that is basically my job's gone from just looking after the animals to now, ironically, a bit more like my old job in that it's a lot more training and a lot more passing on skills to other members of the team and other, you know, visiting people. So we have sometimes we have volunteers not so much in the last year but before that we'd always have quite a long list of applicants wanting to you know give their time to come and work with the amazing animals that we've got uh, we would have interns for a year or six months or so we would have people who actually work in the field with certain animals that we have here and i guess if you've got quite an open mind you can really learn a lot from everybody around you which is great so i'll kind of use that to my advantage i guess to kind of um well allow me to go to places that i wouldn't ever have been before so just making friends with for example edge fellows that we have so the edge of existence program um it's run by a team in the zoo here and we've had the odd edge fellow come and you know have a couple of months with us here and i guess it's quite often the way when you meet people they're always from a different country it's always like oh yeah if you ever want to come to such and such a country let me know and likewise if they ever come back i'm always like yeah sure we'll go and we'll find some snakes in surrey or wherever and um i think these people often say it without ever expecting me or anybody else to traipse halfway around the world to go and actually call them out on it but i've done that a few times and it's really good because it means that you've just got you know you know people who work with the things that you are really passionate about yourself and it's, it's just, i just find it really really interesting so for me now i try and you know travel as much as i can do when i can um, I'm lucky that with work, I've been able to go and do a little bit of research in Vietnam. So that is the far right hand picture. Um, that was in 2019. We spent about two weeks basically walking around the mountains um, near the border with China up in northwest Vietnam. We've got a, a long term amphibian monitoring project up there. And for me, that was our first proper place to field work. And I absolutely loved it. Just for me, it was essentially like going out being paid to go on holiday to go and find like the coolest frogs and snakes that there are in Vietnam. I thought it was great. Um, so when the opportunity came up again to do that again, I was like, yeah, put my name down for it. Definitely. Um, obviously last year happened, so I didn't get to go to Vietnam. I don't think many people got to go to many places, but hopefully next year we'll be back there doing the same sort of long-term monitoring projects. And we have some pretty cool um, research outputs from that as well. So this is I'm part of um, in the past couple of years, they've described several completely new species to science, which is really cool. Um, and some of these animals are assessed as critically endangered by the IUCN. So literally, we don't even know that these things exist. And before you know it, they are almost on the verge of being extinct, which is a really big wake up call, I think, for me to want to keep on doing the kind of work that I am doing to help, 
like a one raise awareness through the animals that I work with here when people come into the zoo. Hopefully design really nice exhibits and keep animals to a really high standard so that without anthropomorphizing too much, the animals are happy, people are happy, I'm happy, everyone's happy, the whole world works better that way. Um, and there's been other cool things as well. So that picture on the far left, that's me and Chris Peckham, maybe last month or the month before, did some sort of radio interview, I think, for the BBC. So again, just another nice little opportunity that opened up and I thought, yeah, why not do that? That'll be fun. Always admired the way that Chris sort of just speaks his mind and you know, he's not afraid to go and get his hands dirty in places. And I kind of feel like in a way, I would think along the same sort of lines. So I guess that's a bit of a, a story of how I got to where I am now. Is that all right, Holly? Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Dan. That's a, cool. yeah, there's a lot to pack in there. Um, last up, we've got <laughs> Danny, who's going to give us an introduction uh, to a bit of her background. And then I've got, I've already thought of some new questions and the ones I was planning based on the things you guys have said and some common themes that seem to be coming out. So Danny, over to you. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm Danny. I'm um, a postdoc now, postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Zoology at the Zoological Society of London. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't worry, I'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> um, so I guess my kind of journey to working in conservation is a, is a bit of a stereotype. <laughs> um, you know, like I was, I was always, always really obsessed with animals. I grew up in in Birmingham and kind of there's not a lot of wildlife but <laughs> but there's some uh, and I was always 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 watching every single nature show that was available on the tv um I was like super obsessed with crabs at one point because of the natural history show about crabs and I'd like run around the playground just like doing pincers everywhere that was pretty weird but anyway, maybe an unhealthy obsession. So some people like my teachers may have said, but look where it got me now. Um, so I decided really early on that I was quite keen to go down either an academic route or a TV route revolving around animals. And kind of my when I was in year six at school, I wrote had to write an autobiography and it's like, where are you going to be when you're older? And I had these arrows and one of them was like, I'm going to do a PhD in zoology. So it was a pretty linear route. I studied hard at school. I went to Bristol University and did an undergraduate degree in zoology. Um, and while I was doing my undergrad in Bristol, I also um, got a job as an ecological consultant alongside. Okay, um, so for the summers, I was doing a lot of bat surveys, reptile surveys, um, new surveys, and I basically got that job because I had a car. Um, there wasn't really anything else to it. They needed more casual consultants. They were trying to recruit from the students and having a car was really useful because it meant I could drive people to the sites. So that was pretty good. It was paid and it gave me a lot of experience in kind of UK wildlife um, and wildlife ID, um, using bat detectors, that sort of stuff, which, you know, although I'd grown up kind of looking a lot at amphibians in particular, I don't know, no one in my family was really interested in animals and I can't say I knew a lot about them other than, oh, that, that's that. And, you know, I kind of had to find my own way. So it was good to get more of a formal training in that area. Um, and also I got some paid work doing like pollinator surveys for one of the labs. Um, it basically anything, anytime I saw anything that was like tangentially related and paid, I would take it. Um, and so I... I the other thing that I would note is I did a field course to Costa Rica and um, I, I paired that with going to Honduras. And that was when I found out that I'm like really, really not cut out for tropical field work because I nearly died from mosquito bites. I was, my whole body was just mosquito bites. It was very itchy. It was very unpleasant. I swell up like a golf ball. It's just not, I'm just not, I'm not, my body doesn't want me to be around that many mosquitoes. So that was a learning experience because uh, the, I found the jungle was, was not really well, well suited to my physiology. Um, so I got my degree and then I went to Leeds um, and I did the same masters as Kate, although I did the masters in research. So I did less taught elements and that was because 
I kind of knew I wanted to go and do a PhD afterwards. Um, so I did two big research projects there. And the reason I chose that master's project was because I was looking at masters in biodiversity and conservation. I knew that's what I wanted to go into. And I got a place at Leeds and I got a place at Imperial. And Imperial was really expensive and it was really expensive to live in Ascot. So the reason I chose the, the master's degree I did was because Leeds was cheaper to live in and the fees were cheaper. And that is absolutely legitimate. And I was on a PhD with people that were at Imperial and I saw ended up in the same place. So don't worry about that. That would be what I learned there. Um, and then that was really great because I got to do a project that was really UK based um, and that was doing bat surveys um, in the Yorkshire Dales and that built on as well some of the consultancy work and experience I had um, and I did species distribution mapping of those bats and then I went out to Kenya um, my tutor at Leeds Steve State was like oh, we need someone who knows about bats. No one's done any bat work. And my PhD student is living out there doing some plant stuff and insect stuff. If you want to go look at some bats. Uh, so I did that. And that was great because it gave me experience applying my own research project and executing it within three months, um, somewhere that I did never been before. So um, I learned an awful lot on that project about working with food assistance, about working with local people, about budgeting. I applied for a grant and I got it. So this is all stuff that if you want to go into academia is really, really useful. Um, and then when my master's finished, um, actually of note, I went on another field course to Kenya um, during that and I learned a lot about data analysis actually from that field course um, using distance sampling um, because we had to turn around that project really quickly so I had to get a handle on that new software really quickly um, and I that was based in Lykipia in Kenya and that will become relevant shortly. Um, so when my master's finished I took some time because I'd been looking for PhDs, but before you get your master's result, it's quite hard to get onto a PhD because you don't have your transcripts and stuff. Um, and I applied for loads and loads of jobs and I couldn't find anything. Um, and I was still working as a casual ecological consultant. Um, but obviously in the winter, there's no consultancy work unless you've got a permanent position. And that's when you have to take all your holidays. Um, so that wasn't super helpful for me coming out of um a master's in like September because we were just coming into winter so um I was just applying for everything really um and not having a huge amount of luck and then I got a job in a call center in market research um I was still in Leeds I stayed in Leeds and that was actually quite interesting in in many ways to kind of work in that that data analysis and data collection, which wasn't conservation related, but it was calling people up and interviewing them, which often you do end up doing in conservation. Um, and then I was at a bit of a loss because I'd always thought I wanted to go and do loads of field work, but the more I looked at it, the more it, I realized it didn't really pay. And also that, it's really hard to do a PhD that involves loads of field work because you have quite a short amount of time. And also that I didn't have a huge amount of field experience, particularly abroad, because I'd done, I'd only done really that one research project as part of my master's. And so I was kind of hoping to get that work published and while I was working in the call centre, but that didn't happen because Frankly, three months is not long enough to do a publishable field project in an area where no one's worked on that species before. I think I was a little over ambitious. Um, so then I went, yeah, I just started applying for PhDs really, and I got rejected from loads of them, but I got a place on the London Merck DTP. Um, which was, it was the first year that that was in place. And I, the great thing about it was you didn't have to have a project. You didn't have to have anything. You just had to get on. And then once you were on, you kind of sort it out later. Um, so that worked really well for me because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I was having a bit of a crisis because I realized my dream job didn't really exist. Um, and then, so I went through that process and met loads of really cool people. Um, and then I met Rosie Woodruff 
Um, and I realised that we got on really well. She had similar interests to me. I've always been very interested in politics and policy. Um, and she was as well. And I asked her about working on badgers and she was like, oh, do you, well, I don't have a badger project, but I have this wild dog and climate change project. And do you want to do that? And I was like, sure. So that's how I got onto my PhD, which was on African wild dogs and the impact of climate change on African wild dogs. And my PhD was very com computational, it was very computer based. Um, I took the data set from that long term project and I turned it into um, models of wild dogs under climate change. I spent a few weeks in the field, but no longer than that. Um, and the other reason, the reason that kind of gelled quite well with me was because I'd already been to the field site on my um, field trip at, when I was doing my master's at Leeds. So that's quite interesting. Um, so uh, my PhD was when it became a little less linear and I just took the opportunity to do everything I possibly could. So I did two policy internships, one in Parliament um, and one in uh, the Royal Society and the policy team. And I fully was kind of after that intending to go into policy. I wanted to go into policy after my PhD, um, communicating science, you know, science advice for policy. Um, I felt like that was where you can make the biggest difference. And then I got kind of sidetracked and um, got really into um, social media. And people had told me um, there's another PhD student at um, the zoo who got a grant off the back of Twitter. And I was like, oh, I'll do that. So I started on Twitter and it kind of was really great to connect with people and really great to network with other people, um, both early career and later career. And then I accidentally started a viral hashtag about animal farts. And then we turned it into a spreadsheet and then I was on the news in front of Parliament. That's where that picture's from, talking about animal farts projected in front of Parliament. And then we got a book deal, me and Nick, who I've never met to this day, uh, written, I think we've got five books out together now. Um, he lives in the US and we've never met each other. Uh, but we started the Does It Fart hashtag together. So that's how I became an author by accident. Um, <laughs> and then... Towards the end of my PhD, we were applying for grants to extend the work on wild dogs and climate change. And luckily we got this big NERC grant and that's what funds what I do now, um, which is basically extending my PhD work where um, now we're working with the keepers and the dogs at the zoo and we're putting these um, collars onto them that measure acceleration um, in, um, in three different directions, 40 times a second. So you can see like every footstep that the dog's making and those collars um, and the data we get off them at the zoo will enable us to interpret the data from the field. And those collars are going out in two weeks time. And then I can build some really, really, really detailed models. The models for my PhD were pretty detailed. These are like next level um, computational models where we can kind of heat up the wild dogs in the model and see what happens. Um, so day to day, mostly what I do is coding and a lot of like admin and organization um, of the data collection. And I'm like the data manager, basically, for the project. Um, and it's great because we, our team is global, working with loads of students um, and also doing the work at the zoo, which is really exciting. I was supposed to be going to the field, but coronavirus cancelled that. Um, so I'm doing video training instead, but it's a bit sad. But um, yeah, I, I really, really enjoy it. It's a really neat job and it's really nice to have your work extended in that way and to be there for the ride as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, so kind of all of you have started off with just a love of animals and then seen where it's led you, which is quite interesting, but without not without a lot of dedication. Um, and I think that obviously one of the key themes that you've all mentioned uh, is, is volunteering and also competition. And I wondered, I have kind of two questions based on that. The first being, given how much competition there is within the industry, within each different little section, each section of it that you guys each kind of specialize in, how can, how have you made yourself stand out? How do you think other people could make themselves stand out? Has anyone got any thoughts on how they could do that? Off the top of their heads, anyone wanna have a go at it? Um, I just think it's about talking to as many people as possible. I mean, I didn't actually volunteer. So um, I think it's 
a bit unusual. I think it's unusual that I didn't. But I think I did the way the way I made it through without volunteering is I just any paid work anyone was offering me, I just took it. Um, and also I think it's yeah, it's just about getting yourself known to the right people. But it's sometimes hard to know who the right people are. It is a lot of it is luck. Yeah. But by knowing more people, you're more likely to know the right person. <laughs> and I think maximizing your voluntary experience. So if you are take you know if you are volunteering with an organization try and carve out a specific role or like a little project within that so you can be like oh well I've I've worked on this project and I've been able to do this you know x y and z and that's resulted in this you can talk about that in an interview with sort of actual experience but yeah that kind of stuff mm. I think I think it's quite I think it's often quite difficult for people kind of moving into this that trying to pursue this career given that how much is how much reliance there does seem to be on volunteering and working for free mm -hmm. is there still has there been a shift away from that is it still a really important aspect and I mean Danny I suppose you've managed it without doing all of the work for free and that can prohibit those that maybe can't don't have the mm -hmm. capacity in their kind of lifestyle to be able to do that is there an alternative do we think or is that still going to be a mainstay in the career in sort of conservation careers for a while do you think I would say it probably depends exactly which route you want to go down. So I think what was quite fortunate for me in terms of the job I ended up getting was that I had got a bit of a track record working with animals and, you know, people knew they could give me a set of keys and trust me not to let the monkeys out or not to get bitten by that crocodile, um, which might sound like a really obvious thing, but it is. I, I, I'd say if I were in a a position where I had a bunch of applicants in front of me and you know let's say one out of the five of them had actually worked with animals before if everything else is equal of course the job would go to the person who's got the track record because it's all well and good having you know five different degrees and oh I've read a thousand books all about reptiles but if you've never actually held a snake or you know trained a crocodile before then I think those are things that you can't really almost be expected to just be dropped straight into so that will, yeah, the voluntary stuff will certainly give you a head start, but it's, like Danny said, it's definitely not everything. It's not the be all and end all. I think a really big part of probably getting a foot in the door is just, just being a nice person, <laughs> you know, just saying please and thank you, having a smile on your face. Um, you know, I got given some pretty miserable jobs when I was volunteering. It was, you know, pouring down with rain all day long. And for, I think for four out of five days from about eight in the morning till five o'clock at night, I was literally outside pulling weeds out of path. And that was one fifth of my university placement, just pulling weeds out of a gravel path around the public. And yeah, it was cold, it was miserable. I didn't really enjoy it that much, but I thought if I complain, I'm gonna get nowhere. So I might as well just keep my head down and get some work done. And I think in one of the pictures there, I was feeding some lemurs maybe, and I was completely psyched to that was the end of that week. That was my final week volunteering and I'd spent the entire week on my hands and knees pulling out weeds from a path. And some of the people took pity on me and thought, no, you need to do something fun here. So come with us. That was nice. Yeah, just perseverance <laughs> and yeah, being a nice person tends to do quite well. Yeah, really good tip. And um, if you guys, now that you kind of have got where you've got to and you're kind of on your way, if you could go back and give one piece of advice to your teenage self at the beginning of this whole process, what would it be? Who wants to go first? Kate? Yeah, I can. I So I think I would, like a lot of the things that I've done that I think were useful in me getting to where I was, I very much had to learn myself. So it was Googling, trying to talk to the relevant people, occasionally being able to go to a conference or something. Um, and yeah, I think what I would do is I would give myself like, this is what you need to do to set yourself up well to be able to move in that path rather than trying to you know work it out around a full-time job or studying as well and kind of you know it was it was a challenge but then I feel like also you kind of learn from that and it is great that it gives you that perseverance that resilience which you definitely need I think when you get into conservation but yeah I definitely would set myself up with make sure you're doing this this and this and you know that that'll get you down the, the, the road that you want to. Danny have you got a thought of what you would say? I think I would just tell myself to be more confident in my abilities. I think 
one thing I held myself back a bit with was like not going for and I'm still a bit like this not going for anything 100% and being like well that's really competitive so there's not much point I'll just take this easy route over here um and I think earlier on I could have maybe just kind of done been a bit more focused initially and kind of like it worked out in the end but I, I think it was more kind of despite the fact that it, I I often avoided things that I wasn't I felt I wasn't good at and but now I kind of have had to do them I'm like oh hang on I was like never actually bad at this thing and if I'd thrown myself into it earlier I would have skilled up sooner and had less of a struggle later is what I would say but yeah throw yourself into everything <laughs> uh Dan have you got a piece of advice you'd give your teenage self um yeah, yeah, I guess it's sort of a, a bit of a mixture of what Kate and Danny have both said. So, yeah, if you're going to do something, do it well. Um, kind of goes back to what Kate was saying about just having like you know, maybe one thing that you are known for. And a bit like Danny, maybe when I was younger, I probably wasn't the most confident. And because of that, I couldn't say hand and heart, yes, I've missed out on opportunities because I didn't take them. But I'm sure things existed that I probably have since forgotten about and just thought, you know they're never going to pick me there's no point in embarrassing myself in front of everybody um so yeah i'd probably just tell myself to actually just you know believe in yourself a bit more and uh, yeah just say yes to opportunities make the most of things good tips for anyone that's watching as well um so if anyone that is watching has any questions that they want to put to our panelists do pop them in the q a function of the chat and we will put them to these guys in the last sort of 10 minutes that we've got um in the meantime i've got loads more questions i can continue to ask you guys i want to know about um in terms of looking into the future of of what's happening in conservation um, and what will happen over the next 10 years what do you think the biggest challenge will be um in your sort of in conservation in general or your section that that might impact careers or working in the sector? How might that kind of look across the next 10 years? We'll start with Danny. I think conservation and something I didn't appreciate early on is that the conservation isn't really about animals. It's not about animals. It's, it just literally isn't like some parts of it are, but really the way to conserve species is to work with people and local people. So I think the biggest challenge in conservation is working with people that have to live alongside the wildlife and giving them the resources to do conservation. It's not about us going in to do the conservation and that transition I think is difficult and I think also sometimes we don't have the right skill sets for it. Um, so we need to work more with like the social sciences and with um, in-country organisations, which is something that is always very good at like having people working in country um and yeah so I think it's just going to be a big challenge in like reframing those skills and making sure that we're working with people not kind of parachuting in and then doing our conservation and then leaving mm -hmm. would you guys feel the same way as that or is there anything else to add Kate I definitely would agree with what Danny was saying that yeah it's about human wildlife coexistence is going to become more and more important and like doing it in the proper way that means that it is yeah we're delivering effective conservation but working with local people on the ground and especially human wildlife coexistence and sort of partnered probably with a shift towards more rewilding it's only become, going to become more and more of a, a prevalent issue as we see more and more sort of predators potentially put back into the landscape or you know contentious creatures that wouldn't necessarily have been there well or haven't been there recently historically then yeah, I think it, it's really like Danny was saying, it's all about working with people. Mm. Dan, is it is any difference within those kind of zoo-based careers? Is that, what sort of challenges do you see coming up over the next 10 years within the sort of zoo relation to conservation? Exactly what Danny and Kate have said. Yeah, so I, um, I recently did a course, one of the um, Daryl courses, um, that was about endangered species recovery. So basically setting up a management program to effectively conserve threatened species and one of the key take-home messages I took from that was that conservation is exactly what Danny said it is like 90% about people and having these people skills and being able to again I guess just maybe it's a really blunt way of putting it but just being a nice person being likable um, being the sort of person that people want to have on their team or 
you know, kind of forming the team that, that you want to have and having people work well with you. Because as a team, you can achieve so much more than an individual. Like, you know, if, if you know, if I was so good at my job, they wouldn't need a whole team, would they? They just have one person here. But a, a whole group of people have so many different ideas and so many different experiences that have all led them to be in the position they are right now. And they've all got a slightly different way of thinking about things. So maybe this kind of goes back to one of your earlier questions, but I suppose that there isn't necessarily any what I would say is any right or wrong path to take to get to where you end up, but a variety of paths is, is great because it's just life experience, isn't it? So mm. in terms of challenges in the next 10 years or so, probably just continuing this and being able to actually, you know, for example, if the UK ever gets wild links again, um, actually getting people on board with that and realising that there can be immense economical benefits to that sort of stuff and the kind of money that animals like that can bring in to local economies will far surpass whatever forestry commissions will make from the little plantations of timber. So yeah, getting people on board and forming good long-standing relationships is what I'd say. Fantastic. Um, I was also curious to know how the way that you guys have been working has changed. I imagine, the la I mean, the last year has been challenging for everyone, but I wanted to know a bit about how the way that you guys work in your careers has, cha has changed over the last year and whether it's going to go back to how it was before the last year for you guys, or are there lessons that you've learned over the last year that you're going to take forward with you um, about the ways of working? Anyone got any thoughts on that? I mean, honestly, it's like not changed that much for me because my manager lives in Cornwall. And anyway, so I don't really see them very much. The biggest change for me is I've not been in the office, which is weird because I, I love working at the Institute. I love the team there. It's a great atmosphere so it's been a bit brutal working from home I don't think many people have been missing whenever you see those articles where it's like people aren't missing the office I'm like I'm missing the office <laughs> it's in a zoo it's great I love it um but in terms of like the way that I work we have an international team and we all live all over the country anyway so we've always had these kind of remote working systems in place um had to cancel field work but we're just doing it all I didn't really need to be there, you know, we could, we can do it on video, <laughs> the training. So it's, it's better in person and it's nicer in person and it's easier to learn in person, but it's okay to like make a video and send it over and video call instead. And in terms of like nice. the, the terms of the field work that's sort of been, it's not been able to happen in the last 12 months, will that all be quite easily made up, do you think, by kind of the different sort of students and mm. researchers that we've got or has some stuff? I'm going to have a mad out? rush at that end because because in academia it's a three-year funding cycle and we're a year mm -hmm. late with the deployment so really i think mostly it affects me as the data analyst because it means that i'll have less time to analyze the data so it's a big challenge but mm. if we'll probably need to try and find some more funding to complete Mm -hmm. um, which might not happen in my job might finish before yeah. <laughs> so that would be a shame um but it it's kind of like there's no way to adapt to those kind of delays and mm -hmm. the funder hasn't ex made, done an extension so yeah. there's not a lot you can do about it really Kate and Dan has it changed the way you guys work much over the over the last year other than there just not being people in the zoo Dan has it <laughs> has it impacted your day-to-day -day much um, in terms of day to day, my job isn't really that public facing anyway. So in that sense, it hasn't really affected much. Um, on the other hand, it's been it's been a good test of everyone's adaptability, I think. So, for example, there's usually quite a few conferences within the kind of mm. zoo community for each different department, let's say. Um, so for me, it's the reptile and amphibian working group. That's like the big UK thing each year. Um, this year it's virtual, as I imagine pretty much everything will be. Um, and I think that's a great thing because before you would have people from all over the UK converging into one zoo for a weekend or half a week or so of talks and presentations. And yeah, it's good, it's fun and everything, but it does really make you wonder, did you need to go there? So for example, last year I was mm -hmm. meant to be going to China to do about, I think it was a five day presentation um, for some Chinese Zoological Association thing. And yeah, Corona happened, so I didn't end up going to China, but yeah, I, I offered to just pre-record everything and send it out, um, and I was more than happy with that because did I need to sit on a flight for 14 hours to 
or if it was Fujian, I think it was, um, probably not. Um, so yeah, it's been nice to know that we can actually still achieve an awful lot without yeah. necessarily having, for example, the environmental impact that would have come along with that. Yeah, and I think true. sometimes it could seem a little bit like it's a bit hypocritical. You know, you work in conservation, but then you fly for 14 hours each way to do a two day conference. Did you really need to go? So I think moving forward, there's going to be a bit of a shift in that way. And it saves money too. So, for example, the company what you might work for will save so much money on travel. Mm. And imagine what better use that money can get put towards. Mm. Brilliant. We've had a question through from, we've got a couple of questions just to finish off today. Um, we've had a question through from Seb, who has said that he is asking for any advice on A-level subjects that helps you to get into your chosen courses. Was it just the sort of standard biology, chemistry, maths? Or was there anything, was there anything extra or different that you found has given you surprising help? My motto in life is never do anything, never make anything harder than it needs to be. I did not do chemistry or physics because they're really hard. And so I did uh, geography, psychology and biology as my main A-levels. And that was what I needed to get into university. And it made my life a lot easier. So. Grand. Similarly to Danny, I was, yeah, didn't go down the chemistry and physics route because I wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. <laughs> it's biology, geography, history, uh, German, I did as well, completely unrelated, but yeah, got me to where I needed to be. Brilliant. Dan? Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, so I did do chemistry. Uh, <laughs> so did it, I, it's okay. it was very difficult. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what I did do that I think is kind of useful is I did do business studies um, and biology. Um, so I kind of had that sciencey, you know, outdoorsy sort of information coming in. Did um, geography for GTSE as well, which I really enjoyed. That was just mm -hmm. for me, like my mind was getting transported to volcanoes one week, or you know, Africa, <laughs> or you know, tectonic plates the next week. I found that really interesting. But yeah, business studies. It's kind of cool how you can link. Again, going back to that links example I spoke about earlier, how you can link actually developing, you know, better even more sustainable livelihood for people in a local community, whether it's Kenya or Northumberland, um, you can sometimes have a really, really big impact um, with wildlife. Um, I, I haven't got the figures with me at the minute, but um, yeah, I'm reading quite a good book at the minute. So I don't know if anybody else has read it or has got it, but it's called Rebirding. Oh. It's pretty good. That's got a similar take on this sort of stuff, um, essentially how we will as a you know a country as a as a planet all be better off with a bit of a more natural setup in that sense um, in terms of better job opportunities and just a more well working ecosystem that's a really bad way of putting it but <laughs> yeah it's interesting okay. book anyway good tip good tip right i think we have time for one final question that's come in from amelia um and i'm gonna give you the challenge of trying to answer this in one sentence uh this is for all of you uh, where do you see yourself in 15 years <laughs> the challenge to answer that in one sentence I feel is real but we'll go first to Kate I think I would love to see myself running a program of work within ZSL within our conservation department having upskilled myself within the areas that Danny was mentioning previously so the more social side of conservation is a real area of interest for me uh, so yeah I'd love to have upskilled myself built up my technical knowledge and expertise within that area and then be designing and implementing a program of work within that field in that space we'll go to dan next one sentence where do you want to be in 15 years in 15 years i would like to be in the same job having a greater impact in the world of conservation very well full done. stop <laughs> and danny i'd quite like to be a professor that'd be pretty good <laughs> fantastic you'll do it <laughs> you back each other brilliant thank you so much guys that's been fantastic i think that brings us to the end of our time and um, if you have any additional questions that you didn't get a chance to answer this evening uh you can send them over to fellowship at zsl.org and we will make sure that we get an answer back to you um thank you so much to everyone that joined us tonight um whether fellow patron guest or speaker it's been really wonderful to have everyone along uh, and thank you for all the questions um fellowship has been at the heart of zsl since its founding nearly 200 years ago and for those of you who have joined the program already 
Um, we really hope that you found value in joining the community of like-minded individuals who are all helping ZSL work towards a world where wildlife thrives. Um, but for those of you that are interested in joining following uh, this evening, ZSL Fellowship starts from £48 um, and can give you an access to a host of privileges, including uh, exclusive events like this one, um, access to both our zoos, uh, fellowship publications and lots more. So just head to zsl.org forward slash fellowship um, if you are interested um, for further information. Um, but lastly, I'd just like to say thank you to our panel once more for sharing so much with us this evening. Um, and I hope that we see you and all our fellows soon, hopefully in person later this year, uh, once the zoos can open and we can do these sorts of things face to face and in person, which would be wonderful. But thank you guys so much. That'd be great. Thank you as well, Holly. No worries. Thank you. Night, everybody. Thanks.